Welcome to a special arts edition of Black Nouveau. I'm Joanne Williams. This week we'll hear the comedy of Alan Edge from the Bronzeville Arts Ensemble. We'll profile singer and music teacher Adrian Danrich. We'll view the artistry of interior designer Kenny Dyson and meet some of our happy staff members. Let's start things off with a profile of three upcoming local hip hop artists. Bobby Drake has that story. How to make an obese child commit suicide. One. Create an image even God wouldn't hesitate to worship. Two, sacrifice anyone trying to wake up from our American dream. Brave new voices. It can be used to describe these young spoken word artists and be used to describe the reason they're all here. We should, we should really all feel special. They're about to go compete against about 50 other teams, and they're representing the Wisconsin team. Let's go! And they're, and they're giving us a showcase of what they're gonna about to go do over there and come back with that. Y'all hear me, BMV team? Go get that and come back with that. The top three poets uh, go on to this competition called the State Finals in March, and the top six poets from there go to BNV. So it's this huge tournament that goes on in Milwaukee. BNV, Brave New Voices, is the largest international poetry slam um, uh, sponsored or put on by Russell Simmons. It's like poet, poet heaven, pretty much. So there's a whole bunch of poets. There's 50 states. There's people from Guam, the UK, coming to compete. So um, it, it was definitely dope. Before anybody is ready to go to the competition, they start in a classroom. They gather together after school for the love of writing. And James Bruss is here to see them through it. I keep my poems in a notebook, thoughts in my head. It changes students' lives. Oftentimes, poets have a label of being introspective. But when they come here and see what their peers can do and the other kids from the schools all around the city, it changes their mind about what their possibilities can do. Because when you're working with spoken word, you're putting your personality on the line. You're making yourself vulnerable and have had four students in the last few years get full rides to UW-Madison through the First Wave program, which is the only urban arts program in the country, and they only accept 15 students a year. And four of those students have been from the creative writing program, Milwaukee High School of the Arts. Milwaukee High School of the Arts may hold the championship, but Jem feels any school could have a successful team. There are 12 schools in the Poetry Slam League right now. Emmett is a shining example of a young artist that isn't from the High School of the Arts, who still made it his mission. Well, in 2010, a, a friend of mine, Elijah, we kind of helped, we were on the B&B team, so in 2011, we brought the High School Slam League to Ronald Reagan, which is my high school I went to, and that was our first year being a part of it. And then after that, I came back and I did a couple workshops with them, and so it was awesome to see that they were still keeping that tradition alive, because Reagan is really not like a high school of arts is not big for writing, so to see that they still got that tradition, they still part of the high school slam league. As alumni, that's probably one of my, one of my favorite moments. The role Emmett walks in as an alumni is one that he holds in high esteem. I am I'm interning. I go to UW Stevens Point, arts management major. Alumni, a part of uh, alumni of Stillwater's Collective. The whole theme of the night was also uh, pass it on. So we had the alumni perform first, passing it on to the next generation. I'm Michaela. I'm this many years old, and my favorite color is pink. Like strawberry milk, and roses, and tea parties, and love. I don't really know what that is yet. I know it has to do with my heart. You know the thing shaped like this? Mikey is another student whose passion for wordplay has given her a new path to walk in life. She's just been a really positive role model and a leader. So if there's a new person that comes into the room, welcome them, like be generous to them, be happy to see them. And Mikey has been really great at that so far. Freshman year, I grew a lot and I kind of came out of my shell. Like I used to be a little bit more awkward and shy and quiet. Then I came in here and my self-esteem got higher. I met a lot of people, the big family experience. So I wanted to kind of rope other people in. The growth they experience on this journey to brave new voices is mirrored with self-discovery, empathy, excitement, and discipline. 
I was actually a bit like poetically exhausted afterwards you know like I found myself afterwards just kind of being quiet for a couple weeks after everything you know because we had we had to get a lot of poetry written in like a month or two months time this year we went in and everyone was more like I don't want to say like friendly but it, you could tell no one really cared about the competition as probably the year before so we all like were more like honest and personal when like we met each other and like in workshops and you could tell like when uh, like every team was supporting all the other teams. It wasn't just, oh, let's go win and win. Like everyone was really supportive this year and it was amazing. I've met a lot of wonderful people. A lot of my closest friends are through this program and plus it's really fun, so. Although the B&B team did not win, the passion to pursue poetry remains. Write what you feel and don't write for scores, right? honestly and right from the heart and it's very cliche but it's really true when it applies to this art form. And swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. With all the command of that powerful voice, you'd be surprised to know that Adrian Danrich originally wanted to be a teacher. My mother actually was the one who drove me getting into the performing arts school. Um, she really saw at an early age that I could sing and that I had a passion for singing. I was singing along with everything. I was like wrong, born in the wrong era. You know, Otis Redding, oh my God, I would just, you know, sing all of his little songs sitting on the back of bay and all that. And um, I just had a, a passion for music. And I honestly thought, after all of that, I really thought that because I had such great teachers, I would be a teacher. You know, I, I'd gone away from wanting to be a performer to wanting to be a teacher. But for anyone who enjoys opera, for anyone who loves to hear a wonderful voice, be happy that she chose to perform rather than spend a career in a classroom. When you were in high school, when you were in elementary school, did you say, hey, I want to be an opera singer? Absolutely not. What did you say? <laughs> when I was in elementary school and, and before, um, I wanted to be a pop star because my father, um, had, well, he's still, see, he's 65 years old, and my daddy uh, has his own blues band. And back then, he was singing more rhythm and blues and funk and stuff like that. So I made my stage debut, so to speak, at age eight, <laughs> singing Aretha Franklin tunes and Shaka Khan and all of those things. And um, that's what I really thought I was going to do until I got into the Performing Arts High School. On a high school field trip, she heard opera it changed her life. That's when I discovered I had never heard opera, ever, in my whole life. Like, I mean, didn't even know it existed, really. Um, and we had to learn, of course, how to sight read and play the piano. And we would, they would take us to uh, Opera Theater of St. Louis. And the first opera I ever saw live was uh, Don Giovanni. And it was just, I, I was astounded by the whole they didn't have microphones. Uh, you know, if you're singing in a, a funk band, you know, my dad has his microphone and it, it follows him everywhere, right? No, it was just absolutely wonderful. And then I just fell in love with how I felt when I sang classical music. When you started singing opera around the house, what did your daddy say? Oh, they were so over me. <laughs> I, you know, that one of the things I would sing a lot was the Leontine Price commercial for the United Negro College Fund. I would sing that thing and my mother would be like, shut up! <laughs> if you don't stop that singing. But then actually, once I started really getting into it, um, and I started winning a couple of competitions when I was in high school, then, you know, I think they came around to say, hmm, maybe this is something <laughs> that might be good for my baby, you know. Now, since at one point you considered teaching, what do you want kids to know about opera? That yeah, opera's fantastic. I want them to know that opera is no different, really, than any other kind of music.
So there is something for everyone. And guess what? Those things are in English. <laughs> so people say, the students are like, oh, I can't understand. Honey, it's in English, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so there are, it doesn't have to be in German or Italian or French or what have you. Um, there are things out there for everyone. That's what I would say. And when she performs in her one-woman show called This Little Light of Mine, highlighting the careers of singers Marian Anderson and Leontine Price, she brings it all back to her first love, teaching. You do master classes. Yes, ma'am. Which involve students who are interested in the same subject. Yes. Do you ever do classes for kids who have no concept of what you're doing? Yes. This is all new to them. And when you do it, do you ever see that spark in one or two of these kids? Oh, my gosh. Okay, so I have to tell you. One of the, the children said, um, I, I was like, she should be my agent. <laughs> she was fabulous. She said, she, when she walked in, she thought she was going to be bored. She had no time t for this whole, you know, singing thing, or opera singing. She's like, whatever, I'm not interested. She said, the first song I sang made her cry. I know that I'm doing the right thing. I know I'm in the right place at the right time. You know, it's not so many people who get into opera you know, think about, or, or music, or whatever. Sometimes it's about the fame. It's about what's coming to them. For me, it's about what goes out of me. And that makes me feel good. That makes me feel really good. When I get a letter like that, that's what I'm working for. That, that child is who I am singing to and singing for. When you're purchasing a lot of foreclosed homes, you really don't know what you're getting yourself into. Exactly. It's, it, there, there's a lot of give and take. You just have to be willing to go in and make the assumption that things are probably worse than what they currently are. But you can really see it's really good. Pressure. Interior designer yeah, Kenny Dyson yeah. believes a home should identify who you are, regardless of how you purchase it. When, when, when you're looking at something like this, mm -hmm. <clears throat> where it, 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 look, it doesn't look appealing to the eye, mm -hmm. a lot of times, it can really be a good thing. When I meet with the client for the very first time, I like to get a really good feel for them. I want to get inside of their head, see what their ideas are, what are their concepts, what are their goals, what are they actually looking to accomplish uh, with the project that they have in place, and then take it from there, and I want to maybe make some type of a, a direction, get some really good direction on where they want to go, and tie it in where it comes out in a really nice, cohesive manner. If you want to change out the tile, if you want a new vanity, a new toilet, if you want to do uh, tiling up to the ceiling, if you want to do wallpaper in there, if you want to do just solid paint, that's where your, your, your actual design concept comes in, into play for that bathroom. So these are things that can be rectified. It's just a matter of putting up, um, shedding the, the walls, making sure that the walls are, are, are intact where they can be, um, have something to a a adhere to it, whether it's paint, wallpaper, or tile. I've actually gone and done uh, kitchen renovations, living room renovations, things of that nature, assisting people with color schemes, uh, with the scale of furniture. Some people have homes that are very, very large. They need a particular scale of furniture to fit that space. You can't take little bitty furniture and put it in a big, large room. You have to have the right criteria of furniture to put in the right spacing for the home as well. And walking into Dyson's home, his space, which is an example of his work, it catches your eye. It's inviting, warm, and reflects him. The backstory to this home showcase, Dyson was looking to buy a house, and a lot of the traditional homes on the market didn't appeal to him. I like the large open concept. I like to walk into a space and have some space. So um, I thought I would go and venture into a different area and start looking for warehouses, commercial buildings, properties that people probably wouldn't even think about living in and convert it and make it my own. So with a concept in his head, he bought and renovated this space. It was a warehouse. It was a small, uh, a small warehouse. A gentleman ran a business from here. And the outcome was just what he visualized, a vision whose color came from a couch. 
I saw this beautiful purple couch and it was just very odd. It was different. It was unique. It was something that I had never seen before. Even the shape of the couch was actually different. So I purchased the couch before I even actually had a place to live. I didn't even have a place to, to put the couch. I just bought the couch because it was beautiful. <laughs> so I actually purchased the couch first and that was actually the initial uh, uh, idea, the scheme that actually gave me the idea for the color scheme for the home. I have velvet wallpapering on one accent wall. And then on the other wall, I have wallpaper that I had put in place that was actually especially made for this project. And uh, it, it implements every strong color in the house. The living room, dining room, and kitchen is one huge, large, open concept. Uh, it's Asian-inspired. Uh, there's a lot of uh, water features in the home. There's a waterfall. Uh, there are fire pits in the home, a fireplace in the home. These elements allow me to come home and to just relax, come home and to hear the, 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 the natural water running. There's a water feature in the bedroom as well. There's a fireplace in the, in the, in the bathroom. Uh, these things allow me to get into my jacuzzi tub and just relax his general advice to people looking to do home improvements. A lot of times when you have the integrity of a home that you want to stay with that integrity, make that house look like it's in that time. If you have a Tudor or if you have a rent style home, a lot of times you may want to stay in the same parameters of, or even a, a Victorian home. You may want to stay with the scheme of that home. If it's a Victorian, make it look like a, a Victorian home. You should have pieces that, that identify themselves with the structure of that home. If you want to make it a little more fancier or have different ideas, then we can take those things from there and we can actually do a lot of things that are cohesive that will make that home what you really want it to be. The person is currently renting right now. You really don't want to put too much into that design concept. If you want to do wall colors, things of that nature, something that the, the, the landlord, the homeowner would allow them to do, then absolutely make it reflective for them while they're there. If they're standing, if they're planning on staying there for a very long time, absolutely. They should have colors that make them feel welcoming, colors that make them feel engaged in their own homes. When you do the, your repairs to your home, if you want to do as much as you can do mm -hmm. and leave the best to the professionals, mm -hmm. I would probably suggest that you leave that to them. And then you won't have to come and do all this small, tedious work mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. And then hire someone that you feel confident in that will come and do the work for you professionally and give you the outcome that you're looking for. Chicago, right on, so sweet, 63rd Street, boy. I told people I was going to the Milwaukee's, like I was going to Mission Field somewhere. We're going to the Milwaukee's. The Milwaukee's, you know it's something like a Mission Field, something like Boonga Boonga somewhere. So we're going to the Milwaukee's, the place where they have bacon ice cream. You know you're going to Mission Field somewhere, right? That's not normal. We're going to have you fried butter on a stick in the Milwaukee's, his natives. I was here two weeks living here before I noticed a pattern. You know how you're just moving around in the house and the TV's on, you're not really paying attention? And I noticed when the news was going off, I'd hear something about, oh uh, yes, and there are five people killed and the fire is burning out of it. Whoop, wait a minute. Breaking news, Buffy the cat is in a tree. The fire department is leaving the building, going to Buffy the cat. I said, oh, that's something, whatever. Next day, uh, yes, there's a holdout, there's hostages, there's been shooting, they have snipers, oh, wait a minute. Breaking news, and Mequon, a deer, ran into the patio, into the kitchen, while they were having lunch. Film at 11. I'm seeing a pattern here. In these Milwaukee's in the West Wisconsin, it is mandatory to have an animal story in every news Am I right or wrong? You people love animals. Then you kill them. You love to kill them. I'm 59 years old. 59 years old, I noticed we, we were raised different than the way they raised kids today. Well, we were raised, that's a pretty big difference right there. <laughs> I'm just saying. See, let me tell you Wisconsin Yankees something. 
See, I'm from Corinth, Mississippi. I was raised in good old Corinth, Mississippi way. Baby, that's right. None of that super name. That's anybody see super names, that's the craziest thing. They bring some chick way from London, England, drive on the wrong side of the road, just like Mary Poppins, trying to tell somebody how to raise kids. Do she have kids? Nobody asked, did they? <laughs> she might have a 12-year-old on the streets of Liverpool selling naughty bitches. Nobody asked about them. Nobody checked, no background check. And she got one solution for everything. All that money they pay that woman. The naughty chair. That's it. I don't care what the kid do. Bobby, you shot your little brother with a 45 hollow point. The naughty chair for you, my boy. Bobby, stop hitting your mama with those baseball bats. Those will not hurt her. Naughty chair, my boy. Man, if I'd have been hitting and kicking on my mama like them kids, she'd have put me in the naughty intensive care unit. <laughs> Baby, they have been rolling me into the emergency room. <laughs> what do we have here? Kid versus mama. Up, oh, he's not breathing. Clear. <laughs> Time of death, 1237. He didn't miss it. He didn't miss it. Let me tell you Yankees about a good old country woman, baby. It's just like a good old country meal. It's stick with you a long, long time. <laughs> not only did we have switches, we had switch trees. That's why you put a switch seed in the ground. The switches will come up. No knot, no flower, no fruit, the secret of what knots are already out there. And then make you go harvest your own whooping, boy. Oh, 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 oh. And you'll never get over it. You remember that the rest. You're gonna have flashbacks the rest of your life. You can get ready to steal something, you'll be like, ah, ooh, oh, ow, oh, oh. What's wrong with you, man? Uh, Vietnam, I'm okay. Come on, all right, the next. My mama would beat us up when it was ever near by. She'd just make up new verbs. Boy, I'll take and flag pole you to death. I'll take this custom and beat you upside your head. Ironing cord with the iron still attached. <laughs> oh, oh, no Department of Children and Family Services. Not back then. I wish to God we get a hat. I'd have a pocket full of dimes. Every time I did something stupid, I'd call them and say, be there. <laughs> Y'all don't get on the way, be there. She fast, grab her hands. My mom would have beat me and DCFS. We both would have been standing over in the corner somewhere, DCFS talking about, boy, you got a mean mama. The only thing I remember about a DCFS was dead child for sure. And I got that right my name is Alan Edge. You've just been on the edge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To close tonight, we wanted to show you some of the MPTV and student staff who helped make Black Nouveau and other MPTV productions possible. We are happy to do so.